Welcome everybody for this mini workshop of the Jepson Herbarium on fungal communities, their dynamics and their interactions with plants and other organisms. I, and this second part of this mini workshop, I'm talking about spores, fungal spores, their production and their dispersal. So when we look at mushrooms, like these clusters of honey mushrooms that were growing happily on campus at some point, people have been doing the math on these and they, um, they discovered that every mushroom forms something like 16 billion spores uh, in this cluster. And you can see them, these spores here, this white stuff, that is all spores. And one spore will not give to an organism that can reproduce. You need a second spore, but still enormous amount of spores. And the success rate of these spores is in general really, really very small because you know they have to find another one that we can mate with, but they also have to find resources. And as you can see, here is already a individual of this particular species, and there's no space for another one because they're being outcompeted. So and uh, the success rate is, it's, it's probably comparable with pollen in this case, I mean, lots of pollen, but very low success rate. So spores can get into the air, but they can get quite far, but they still have to find another one of the same species to mate with. So again, their success rate will be pretty low when they make it out of this little area where they start. Another example of spores, here we have a Ganoderma species here on the left. It forms these brown spores, you can see them here. And again, people have done the math for a fruit body that is square foot more or less. It will produce something like 30 billion spores in a day and that six months in a row. So again, gigantic amounts of, amounts of spores, but a very low success rate of new offspring establishing. You can see the spores when they're in mass, but they're microscopically tiny. So you have to put at least 10 side by side to get the width of an average human hair. In most cases, it's only one cell, so it's not much to it. It needs, as I said, another spore to mate in many cases. In general, they are not long-lived. So by long-lived, I mean, they can't survive very long before they can germinate, before they germinate. They have the same kind of function as seeds, but they're definitely not seeds. I mean, seeds are bigger. They have much more resources. They, they are, the whole plant is already ready to go. This is only one cell. We have an example of a gilt mushroom that is producing spores. And the spores are produced here on the gills. So we here have one. So the gills make it possible for the, for the mushroom to make more surface. It's also nicely protected. Uh, the gills are also keeping it rather moist. So it is an ideal, ideal place to make your spores. So you can have, in this case, one big mushroom. In other cases, you have a lot of small mushrooms, but it is all about making more spores. There are also mushrooms of what we call conchs that are totally different. They have tubes and then the tubes are lined with these cells that produce the spores. And these tubes come something like a centimeter long. So it also means that these fruit bodies have to be, I mean, these are perennial. So they have to be growing in such a way that the tubes are exactly vertical because otherwise the spores fall on the other side and don't get out into the environment. But they're very good at that, I have to say. The opposite of tubes is spines. So again, making more surface to make more spores. This is the mushroom from the top. This is the bottom. Again, a much more surface area to make spores. Then others just make branches on the outside, spores are made. And we can also have a very simple fruit body that just lies on 
leaves and soil, just a crust or a more parchment-like thing. This is brown one. And then the yellow blobs make more surface by being wrinkled and not just a globe, which I call yellow blobs, but it is the richest butter. And so far I've been showing you examples of fruit bodies in this group of the fungi, which we, here we have this gilt mushroom that belongs here and up from lower here. And then this is on top of the other part, uh, the fungi, this group of fungi forms this kind of fruit bodies. Well, this is one example of such a fruit body. And the spores are formed on cells that we call basidia. And this is what they look like. So here we have a basidium sticking out into this space in between the gills. It has four prongs and then each prong forms a spore. Four is the norm, but of course it's fungi, so there are all kinds of exceptions. They can be have one, two, six, or eight, but four is very normal, as you can. And these pores are being shot off in a, in a way that is unique. There's not any other or group of organisms that does something similar to this. And this is an example of how it works. So we have here the prong, we have this asymmetric spore, and it looks like it's blowing a bubble. It's actually a droplet with sugars in it, it attracts more water, it grows, it's a moist environment. And at some point something happens and the spore is being shut off. And this is being shown here in the schematic. So here we have the spore, we have this prong, we have this little droplet, and then here is another very thin layer of moisture. And when this bullet, this droplet grows, at some point it flows over the spore, and that gives the spore its momentum and it being catapulted off. And it's shown here in this little video. Mm -hmm. So here we have the spores, the four spores, here we have the basidium. And this spore has its droplets and I'm hitting it and seven seconds later, you can see it being shot up. There it goes. And it goes in one big sweep. It doesn't go with um, these intervals as this little video shows. And it's like giving a push to a balloon. So it goes a certain way and then it stops and then it falls down in between those two gills or in, in the space of the tube or in between the spines or in between the branches, it's being going down there. And then the wind will take it over. And this little video, hopefully, yes, shows you the spores just moving around these mushrooms. Okay, the music is still horrible there. <laughs> so. So these are the basidiomycetes. So here they do it all like that. And then on the right hand side, we had these ascomycetes, what we call, and they do it completely different, much more simple, nothing like fancy, like shooting off, but shooting off, yes, but not with this beautiful intricate system. So, so here the spores are formed in a tube and most of them have eight. And again, there are other ways of other numbers, but age is again the norm. And these cells line this inside of this cup or line the pits of the morale. And we know a lot about it by research on this tiny mushroom, this tiny fungus on little, here's the fruit body, it goes on dung, it's easy to grow in the lab. And it's easy because there's these big SI and with dark spores, so you can see what's happening. And what's happening is the spores mature, the pressure uh, keeps growing. And then at some point the lid here, the lid flies open and from all the spores are being shot out. And the pressure in these high in these SI can take can be as much as in a car tire. So it is a it's a pressure system, and that kind of system is of course known also from plants and from uh, animals, from moving uh, moving parts. So this is not unique. I wish it was, but it isn't. 
And here we can also see it, I hope. So at some point there's a tip and all the spores are being thrown out um, all at once. And then there's drag getting them up. And then the other interesting thing is that these SI can often move towards the light. So in this case of this little fungus on this mushroom on dung, it's really nice that it's going to the sun away from the dung thing because they want to be the hair spores to land on the grass so they can be eaten by the by the herbivore, the cow, for instance. So and even in morels, it's the case that the SI bend towards the light and shoot their spores off away from the fruit body into the airstream. But not, of course, it's fungi, so we don't have one way of doing things. Not all these fungi in this group have these open fruit bodies. They're also ones that form these little flasks. Here we have it cut open, so we have the opening, and here it goes one by one. So this ascus grows up, shoots its spores off, shrivels back, and the next one can grow up and do its thing and shrivel back and so on until all the acai in this fruiting body have done their bit. But again, a very active, uh, effective way of getting your spores out, though not all at once. But, you know, in both groups, both the ones with the basidia and the ones with the SI, we have also ones that don't shoot spores off. Forget about it. We just keep the spores inside in this case. Embedded, no shooting off. They were lost that organ, that's that mechanism. They just drop off the basidia or they just stay inside the SI. But they've come up with different ways of getting the spores around. They use vectors. Um, for instance, the golemental ground squirrel in this case, eating a truffle. And then we look at the poop. There are the spores. And these spores, so from two species, a false truffle and a Goteria, um, they're still viable. They can still germinate. And so this is a way of getting your spores relatively, not huge distances, but a distance as a squirrel or a chipmunk or any other little mammal, chip and tail thingy in the mountains uh, covers, and then you can still really move around in this way. Stinkhorns do it totally different. So they have their spores in this goo and they're not called stinkhorns for nothing. They really stink. They stink like carrion, like, like uh, dead meat. They look like dead meat and they attract flies. The flies gobble it up and move it around. And it's actually quite an effective way of dispersal of your spores. So in the end of the day, this looks like that. So all the spores have gone. Here we have a puffball. Again, no active shooting, but a bellow system in this. The spores are round, they're hydrophobic and wind dispersed, but something has to push the puff the ball to get the spores out, and that someone can be that somebody can be a uh, a hen, a, can, a deer that steps on it, a branch, a raindrop, and then the spores get out and they're wind dispersed. The wind brings them further away. And these spores are round and uh, colored, a little, tiny little bit of spiny. And you can only look at them under the microscope like this when you add some uh, washing up liquid to your medium, because otherwise you see only air bubbles because they are so hydrophobic. And then uh, dead man's foot is another example of a wind dispersed thing. So here the whole fruit body just it disintegrates into spores. It's one big spore mass that stands there, erodes and the wind will bring it, will do the spores that look like this. And I always am amazed at this because it's fruiting in the middle of summer uh, there's no rain, um, there's no insects activity. These are ectomycorrhizal, so they need to be with tree roots. Um, but they do 
they are fruiting all over the place, I must say. So they are very effective. And then there are these splash cups. The bird's nest fungi make these little lentils filled with spores in little cups, but they have to get out of the cups for because that's what you want. You want your offspring into the world. And so these are uh, made such that a drop of water will just splash them out. And I think that is just super cool way of doing it. I mean, I'm still amazing evolutionary track to make these cups that are made for droplets. But going back to species that do shoot the spores off, it doesn't always mean that they are the spores are distributed by a wind. So here we have this crust. Uh, it's hardly a crust. It's on the underside of a piece of wood. It's lying on the on the forest floor. I mean, wind dispersal. Forget it. So this one mites will disperse it. So mites just walk like lawnmowers through this mushroom, this little crust. They're covered with the spores. You can see here. They eat the spores and they disperse them. And these spores remain viable, even if this little mite is being eaten by a roving beetle or when the roving beetle is eaten by a salamander, there's still a certain percentage of spores that can germinate. This is just amazing. Here we have a close up of the outside of this mite. And here we can see all these spiny things. Those are the, um, the spores of this crust, this tomatella species. So by now, perhaps we wonder from, well, do spores have any protection against the elements? And you have white spores. Doesn't make a difference what color they are. So you have orange, brown spores, yellow, brown spores, orange, brown spores. Here again, white spores, very typical shape and size. There's not much to it. And how long do they? remain viable, what, and do they have any protection? So we have brown spores here and even knobby spores of an inosbe. And then the interesting thing to me is when we look at guild mushrooms and their tree of the guild mushrooms, and it's bent backwards to fit more in this figure, we could also have it straight up. And forget about all these colors because this figure was made for a totally different purpose than I'm showing you here. I'm emphasizing here, I'm emphasizing here the spore color in relationship to where they are on the tree of, this, of these gilled mushrooms. So the old gilled mushrooms are white spores, so it's like these wax cap species. The oyster mushrooms are white spores, mycenas and, and marasmias. Here we have um, shiitake. Here we have a pink sport group, but here we have fly agarics, white spores again. And then from here onward, we see colored spores, brown spores, black spores, purple spores, orange brown, uh, tobacco brown, you name it, brown. Okay, here are the white spores, there are the brown spores. Here we have a group with pink spores, salmon pink, brown spores. But basically this is all white sport groups. And then here we have this one group. I would say they have been experimenting with color. There are green spores, blue spores, yellow spores, red spores, black spores, brown spores, and white spores in it. They've also uh, these puffballs embedded in this group, so they are brown and hydrophobic. So all kinds of things here, but after that, they settled on brown. So here's an example of green, green spores. So what is the advantage of having all these colors? We have other dark spores. And colored spore wall really helps in a lot of circumstances. And these agaricus species, so you better mushroom relative. Um, the amount of melanin in it is amazing. So it is 30% of the spore weight is this melanized spore wall. So the fungus has invested in a lot of melanin to protect its offspring. 
And melanin is protective, protects against UV light, against drying out, and extreme temperatures, high and low. And we know that we can, people have done experiments with, with things, with um, mutants without it, a colored spore will, and they don't survive being exposed to the sunshine, for instance. So melanin is really good. It's expensive to make, but if you have it, you better keep it. But there's also a group of um, uh, gilt mushrooms that's not in the main gilt mushroom, so drosolas and milk cups, and they have a sugar layer or starch layer around the spore on the spore roll. And we see that blue here because of we put this in an iodine solution, so it turns blue. And I think that is also a protection against drying out. But that's my hypothesis. But there's one that. When we look at conchs and other fungi on wood, well, especially conchs in these crusts, they have most of them white spores that remain only viable for a very short period. Here we have again this crust on the underside of a log. All white spores remain viable, able to germinate for a very short period. Of course, there are exceptions because it's fungi. Here we have the brown spores of the Ganoderma. And often you see these fruit bodies before, because of the brown stuff, before you can see the real fruit bodies. There's so many of them, but brown spores really effective against, with a, a protecting against exposure to light. And again, dung mushrooms, they have many cases, they have really dark spores, very thick walled spores in this case as well, which is of course, a disadvantage when you want to germinate, when you want to put your hypha out through this wall. So they have a, a weak spot, which we call a germ pore, and a plug in it, so they can put out their hypha here. And But the thick wall, really, the thick colored wall helps them survive in this open habitat. And also, I would say, with the to going through the four stomachs of the cow, for instance. I mean, that's a very harsh environment with all kinds of different enzymes working their way on the spore, spores and the fungi, of course. So in the end, we would like to know from how long remain spores viable. Of course, it varies enormously. I've said already for a few that these little white spores the thin walled white spores remain viable only a few hours, but there are also spores that remain viable for decades. So these false truffle spores that are waiting for these events that the bishop pine will burn and all the cones are open and the seeds will being dispersed. We don't have, we wouldn't have this forest of young trees at Point Reyes after the 1995 fire if there were no spores waiting for them. And these spores have been waiting a long time because these are it's a species that is early in succession. So it's an early colonizer of the trees that when they just germinate and are not common when the, when the forest is much more mature. So these have been there for some decades. And with that, I give you some points I want to make sure that you will remember of this introduction to fungal spores. They're microscopically small. There's only one cell in most cases. So you can't see them with the naked eye. They're also produced in huge numbers in general. And the way they're getting shot off from a mushroom, that is really unique. So every time you see a mushroom after this talk, Stop a second. I think, oh my goodness, they're being shut off. All the squares are shook off. They're not dropped off, they're shut off. The dispersal, of course, is in many different ways over short distances, long distance, everything in between. You can, you can wind, you can have animals, you can stick into an insect or a mite. They can have some protection by a color wall or by a sugar coating. And how long they remain able to germinate, it also varies from a few hours to decades. And with that, I'm at the end of the second module in the workshop, mini workshop on fungal communities, their dynamics. 
and their interactions with plants and other organisms. And I wonder whether you have any questions about this part on spores for me. 